All right, welcome to the Eric Anders Lang Show. Today's guest, yeah. Nate Bergasi. Yes. You're in an elevator. Someone says, what do you do? What do you say? If I'm in an elevator? El- anywhere. Anywhere where you know that the internet oh, is going to be relatively Oh, they say, oh, what I do is a job. Uh, I just I'm a stand-up comedian. That's it? Yep. Real easy. Real easy. What's Straight the typical the follow-up question? Uh, a lot. Do you do it full-time? <laughs> Do you make your living? That's the most, that's the one, like, do you make, make it, this is your real job? Like, uh, that's probably the most, and uh, the one that hurts your feelings the most. Right. Just for they don't think, because they don't know, I mean, you know, that's the big one you'd always get. You get people that t- wanted to tell you a joke or something. But now, a lot of times people are like, oh, I bet you get asked to tell a joke all the time. And so you get that. And I don't, you know, it's like, I don't have a joke. Like, it, it's your stand-up is like, it's your act. It's not like something you can do very quickly uh but you're you just get asked like oh that's cool you know if they if they don't know and then yeah i think asking if you do it full time if they say can you tell me a joke right now what do you have a response you must have developed a response to that i, I thought of it actually the other day I, I mean a lot of times i don't but i have a joke uh that i did that's the quickest where i say I, i'll say uh because i've been with my wife uh, my whole life since I was 20 years old, and uh, so I went. I went from my mom to her. So I've never had an hour without some lady being like, "I don't know if I would do that." <laughs> and now I have a daughter, so I'll never know what it feels like. <laughs> uh, so that's a, that's about the quickest yeah. that I can get a, a joke out. And that's your brand of humor. You're not. That's 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 an authentic kind of Nateism. Yeah, I mean I, that that's a joke from my act. So. Uh, that's yeah. I give them the real deal. You know, it's a free one I throw out to them. That's a, a professionally written joke. Um, we're going to get into your love of golf in a little bit. That's yeah. why you're on the podcast. Uh, but you're reminding me of this experience I had, and I, and I kind of want to talk to you about where you learned comedy on some level. But yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, I was uh, getting ready to interview Bill Murray. And on some level, you know, me not knowing a lot, not thinking about things, maybe I'm not looking at Bill Murray as a comedian, maybe yeah. the way you did or do. Yeah. And someone I remember now, he was uh, coming off the 18th Spyglass, AT&T Pro-Am, massive crowds. Some guy yells out, tell me a joke, Bill. And he's, uh, everybody goes silent. And Bill doesn't stop walking and like five seconds go by and he just goes, you're looking great today. Yeah. And everybody burst into laughter. And it was like that level of like, it's almost like an art. Yeah. Where do you look at your like, you know, early inspirations or, you know, where you learned? Uh. I would say <clears throat> my dad's a magician and is very funny. And so I, I think that stuff seeped into me without even really realizing it. Uh, just always about, always about the joke, always about the, you know, the, the, the joke is above it all. So it's like you're, you know, you're just trying to be funny. And so like when you, everything's trying to be funny, you're just, that's, that's the main thing. That's the main focus. Uh, so I think that was a big part of it. And then as a comedian, as comedians is like Seinfeld was like the main, you know, uh, I remember seeing, you know, I mean, Seinfeld was like it, like that was just the guy, his his show was the greatest show ever. And, and then his stand up, and he was always like very true to it. And then as I got into it, I loved like seeing guys that were like true to stand up, like Jay Leno kept doing stand up the whole time. And I love guys that were like, yeah, I'm a stand up comedian. They might do other things, but stand up is the, the, it's the thing that got them there and the thing that they're going to die doing. And I, I love that. I love just, you know, staying true to what you do. It's almost like the most simplest form of entertainment. It's like, it's like the evolution of the jester or the, yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, you're, you know, you can sometimes be when you're doing these shows and you just have all these people watching and you're like, I'm just talking. Like it's just one person talking. There's no, lights fire you know i mean like there's not all this stuff it's just you having to like either paint a picture and what people and and to keep people's attention especially nowadays like uh so it's there's not a lot of not to it and it's fun you know they always say that the big same is like rock stars want to be comedians and comedians want to be rock stars because we want to feel what it feels like to have the chaos around and like that like excitement and people singing all these songs back to you but rock stars want to feel what it's like to have i mean like when i do a show some of the best things ever is when you can feel the room be quiet because it's i mean it can be 1500 people 2000 people and they're quiet 
and because they're waiting to see what you're about to say. And then that's a level of like, you know, it's just a con it's control and like, it's it's just it's it's un it's an unbelievable feeling to hear. Even I mean, it is very fun that you want to hear the laughs, obviously, but when you hear everybody be quiet, there's not much better than that. Like it's crazy that you're like you made that many people stop talking. That means that many people are paying attention and listening to what you were saying, and that's a pretty wild feeling. I mean, on some level, you're like uh, you're like a conductor with an orchestra of fifteen hundred feelers that are just listening and feeling and waiting to be entertained yeah yeah and you get to see where they you know i mean you you so you, t you tell these jokes over and over again and you get them really good and or you try to and then so you know where the laughs are going to be and you know uh but it's, it's like sometimes you're listening and try to be like you know something sometimes like they're very excited they can laugh more and sometimes they don't laugh as much and they're quieter. You can have, uh, you know, days of the week matter. Like, uh, oh, really? when you perform. I mean, if it's a Sunday, they can be uh, a little bit calmer than Saturday night would be. Because Saturday night, they've been all day and having fun. Friday, like when you do comedy clubs, the the big saying, the famous saying was why Steve, Steve Martin quit comedy was because of the Friday late shows. And that was always the running. I don't, and I don't even know if it's true. It's just this legend of the thing that you heard. And it's because Friday late shows were the like the usually the wildest crowds because they would work and then they would uh, like the Friday early shows would be quieter because they just got off work. They're tired. They've worked all day and then they you know they have they just probably went to maybe grab a quick dinner and then they're already at the show. But the Friday late show, I mean those people probably went to go grab dinner. They've already drank. They're already drunk. And then they just are just yelling at you. <laughs> and uh, that's where, like, the most problems are going to be. And then it started switching a little bit towards the end. I could feel it. Saturday was starting to become that. Saturday late shows were getting a little bit wilder. Problem. More of a problem. What do you mean? I've, I've never considered that a, you could have a problem on stage as a stand-up. Well, just with people shouting out you and, like, interrupting your act. So you can't do your – like, you, you have to, like, address what's going on and, like – so if you hear someone talk, like I, I'll have people yell out sometimes, and they and usually in their head mind they're doing it in a nice way, like they think they're helping or they think like oh you're gonna heckle me and stuff, and it's like that's not. There are comics that want to do that, but I want to perform my act. I want to do these jokes that I've prepared. I don't want to just you know be like your shirt's ugly and like or you know <laughs> just yell at someone and make fun of them. Right. And so they. They think that they're helping, and so, but they're not. And so, if you don't do this, don't <laughs> yell at comedians. Uh, you, you can use it, but you control it with like the vibe. I mean, I don't really give off a, I don't think I, I give off the vibe that I want that. And then some comics can, and then those comics will give off the vibe that they want to, uh, they want you to like have more playfulness. Right. When you mentioned Seinfeld, I definitely. I, I wouldn't have I don't know quite enough about it to have seen it maybe in the beginning but I think one of the reasons why I love your comedy so much is it's you're finding the absurd in the everyday mm -hmm. right I mean is, isn't yeah. that kind of where I mean if you watch a lot of Seinfeld it would make sense that that's where you would get interested in and that's my show was Seinfeld as a kid yeah. like I love that and I still throw it on yeah uh, even just like last last week I watched uh, a couple episodes and it's just like it's just so funny because it's so relatable, but you don't think about it that way as a as a normal person through life. It's like your job as a comedian at that point is to question every exchange that you have. Yeah, you think, you know, Seinfeld said it where it's like as a comedian, you always like almost have a, you have someone watching. It's you, but you have like a you're another person that's watching every situation. So as you're in the situation, something else is you're like watching the situation to be like, what's, what's funny, what's weird and that's happened. And being relatable is, that's been the best thing for me is to learn to like how to relate to everybody. And sometimes you will tell a story and you're like, I wonder if people will re relate to it. Like with my iced coffee with milk, with Starbucks, like ordering and then, and then not getting there. When I first, you just tell the story and you're like, all right, it'll, it'll either be just a funny thing that happened to me or it will be a thing that everybody like relates to. Like in my special, uh, I talk about like the guy, my name not matching on my Delta, like Nathan and Nathaniel, and they didn't match. And the guy's like, well, the ID doesn't match the ticket. And I would tell this story. And when it happened, I was like, eh, maybe that could be funny. 
and then you do it and then you realize like all these people like relate to it because their names don't match like they're greg and gregory or whatever it is right and so they're like oh that's a I've, that's happened to me and like so they just love hearing the th- you know it makes everybody feel normal i think like where it's they're like yeah yeah that happens to all of us yeah my middle initial is a for anders and my name comes up as erica on the flight, oh yeah on the, on the ticket yeah and so you probably have problems they with wonder that. why i'm not a female yeah you show up and they're just like well i'm not buying any of this <laughs> A lot of people, right? Like one of the things I'm always most fascinated by is, you know, people ask you if it's a real job, if you actually make money. You, you have a dream job, right? Mm-hmm. You travel around the world and you do what you would have done basically for free. Yeah. At what point did you find yourself faced with a decision or find yourself faced with like a, you know, like a, like a, the, that last scene in The Hobbit or whatever? You know what I mean? At what point was it like, all right, I have to act on faith right now or I have to do, you know what I mean? Like, because because people write in a lot to like me to make that jump yeah and they say i want your job how yeah. do i get your job and so the question kind of is weaving in the difficulty of your job and getting to where you've been what can you offer as far as experience from from what you've learned uh you, you I mean you got to just dive all in you have to be obsessed uh you know i always i always tell everybody you have to be very you have to be obsessed so whatever you want to go do whether it's this or stand up or write a book or whatever it is, you have to be obsessed with it. And you can't just like half do it. You can't be like, well, I think I'll try to do it. You're never gonna make it because you're trying to win the lottery. So in order to win the lottery, like you don't deserve it. No one needs you to do this show. No one needs me to do stand up. No one's like, is like, we have to have you just for life to live on. <laughs> like we're, we gotta make it so good that you people do want to watch you do this thing. So if you want to do that and you want to dive into that thing, you have to like be completely, completely obsessed, whatever your normal life of like, whether it be relationships or it be whatever it is, stuff has to take back seats and you have to be completely focused because you're trying to do something that is not owed to you. And so you have to be just, uh, I mean, it's just completely uh, overwhelmed with the amount of work that goes into it. It's very, very hard. It's very, you know, it's, uh, you got to be around. You just always got to be here doing it. Like, you know, for you with your show, like, you know, like I watch your stuff and like, so, but you're constantly putting stuff out. You're constantly having new stuff for me to see. And if the second you don't is the second that I'm, I'm gone and probably watching another person that is. Right. And so that's how much stuff you have to do. So I think sometimes when people think they want to do this stuff, you're like, you do, but do you really want to? Do you really, is, it, is this really what you want to do? Because if you, you're, you're going to, it's either you're, you're either going to put in the work or you're not going to put in the work. Right. And uh, that's what they, that's what they have to, you know, that's what anybody has to do this, do this. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. The persistence is actually maybe one of the hardest parts. And and it began for me at the beginning of this podcast, which, I mean, I was like, I'm going to do two a week. And it was just like, it drove me crazy for a while. But it but I watched others do it. Bill Burr would be sort of the only real podcast I listened to for a while. And I was just like, this guy, this guy's been doing it. And that's yeah. clearly either he loves it or he's just devoted to it. And it's probably a little bit of both. But he yeah, he Burr loves it. Burr was a big influence on me. Like really? he was... Uh, Cause when I moved when I moved to New York in 2004, so I saw Burr when he was probably a 10 to 15 year comedian, and so he was like you know everybody knew him at the clubs, but he wasn't what he is now obviously, and so I got to watch him like go and become who he is, and it was a very big deal, and that's why you got to even be in the world, like you got to be around the world because you got to see. I mean, it's been interesting with you. I've seen you. I think I remember I saw you very early, and then uh, I enjoy like watching someone's like as they rise up and get more and more followers and more and more. You're just around more. You're you're doing. You know, you're seeing like if I watch this. You know, you did that thing with Rick Shields, right? Yeah. That, like in the YouTube, where you went over there and played. But it's fun to sometimes see these, even though you're in the same world. But then I see y'all are together. And then you, I like seeing like, all right, this dude's like really doing it. And you're now like these worlds are kind of coming together and you're being around. And that's that's neat for me because uh, I know that if I want to listen to something and watch something, I want to know that that person's actually like cares. Because if they don't care, then I don't, I should, I'm not going to invest my time in watching them. Because yeah, you could just give up one day and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. And then it's gone. And you're like, well, then what was the point of even ever 
watching you from the beginning. Yeah. And so it's like a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, and it is, it is exactly like when you do this and you have to treat it as if it's the uh, person that you want to marry. And like, you have to be that <laughs> invested because it will be your whole life. I mean, it'll be everything. Every, it all just, I mean, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Well, I know you're already in a happy marriage, but I do appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I would marry you if it wasn't. Uh, well, I've joked with my best friend is that <clears throat> we would do really well if we got married because we could just both, we could sort of pay one membership yeah. to, the, to the club. Yeah. And just do it. It'd be Big great. Benefit. I mean, yeah. on paper, what is love? It's nothing. It's this. It's making this stuff. This is love. So, so at what point are you? Uh, you finish the show. Yeah. It's uh, probably around usually around quarter to ten. Yeah. What is that moment like when you walk off the stage? It's great. It's the. It's my favorite moment. Really. Being done. Just because you're done, and it's uh, there's not another show. You're not like you can just kind of like breathe and. You know, it's like, all right, it's like you can calm down. I mean, sometimes you have like, I do meet and greets and then you're, if you have people at the show and so sometimes that can be a lot because you're still kind of on, like, so you have to go complete, do that. And it's almost more intense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and you're trying to give everybody like, when we do these meet and greets, everybody's very nice and very excited. And as I say, a lot of times I, I try to make nothing's lost on me. I don't uh, take anything for granted and you so you want to like even when you meet one person i mean i, re, I remember like like there's always these weird i remember uh i think it was like joe dimaggio was like uh either him or ricky man like but it was like they're talking about the yankees being like you know you, they would never take a game off because they were like what if one kid bought this ticket this is the only game he's ever going to go see and i'm not playing wow and it was like that was not you know i'm not saying that this is i'm the, I'm the joe dimaggio of comedy uh <laughs> But it's like just that that idea of like, if anything, you can't. What if this one thing all came together and like you, you don't want to just be, you know, even when I do a show, I don't want it to be like I am tired, you know, or like I've been I travel every single weekend and you can be very tired and very exhausted. And maybe you get to the town and I want to go golf or I want to go do something that I want to go do. That's fun. But if it's going to affect the show, that's not fair for that town that all these people that paid for these tickets they think they're going to get this good show. And then I'm just like, well, I'm not feeling it tonight. And like, you just kind of half do your show and phone it in. And it's, you know, it's not fair. It's not, it's not fair to, and that's the reason you're there. And you start taking that stuff for granted. It's over. Like it's, it's going to be, you're, you're never going to become what you're going to could become. It'll start going down because and it, it, I don't even know if there'd be a, someone could point it out to be that's why, but it will just start going down because then you start accepting all of the, you accept that, well, the laughs are just not as big as they used to be. That's fine. And then all that just slowly starts getting worse and worse. And then you're back to where you started, which is nowhere. That's fascinating, man, because what you were saying earlier about the like relationship between viewer and creator mm -hmm. is, you know, you're kind of digging at this thing, like basically selflessness. And yeah. you're saying like, I could go play golf because I want to, and I'm in a place that I'd love to visit. And, but is five hours of sun exposure and dehydration and whatever going to set me up for the best show? And it's, it's interesting. You never really brought up like a job aspect. You brought up the relationship between entertainer and entertained. And that's like, that's, that's, I, I probably don't know if I've heard, I, I would assume a lot of entertainers are quite selfish. I, yeah. I, and I think I'm selfish. I mean, I'm selfish in the fact that like with my family, with my like I do things that are what I need to do for my career or what I want to do. I never like try to use the word work. Like, I mean, I do it. I use it. I'm not saying I don't, but I always in my head was like, when everybody's like, I got to work tonight or do this. Cause it's like, you're not working. Like you're doing, I'm doing what I want to do. So it's, it's almost like, you know, it's a job, but it's like, it's not a job. It's, it's like you're living a fantasy world. Like, you know, so it's like wor work is like I've worked, you know, I've done all the jobs that are <laughs> pointless, you know, that not pointless, like, but they're jobs that are hard work. Like that's hard. Like, and so doing this is hard, but you know, it's my choice. I can at any time stop and then, uh, not get to get to the level that I want to get to. You talked about walking off stage as being a favorite moment. Is there any, is there any segment in the show um, that's like a favorite of yours that is, or, or is that just ultimately material oriented? 
there's you can have new jokes that you're excited to get to. So you have like you can have points, and you try to place them in places. So sometimes I would put them at the beginning, and then sometimes like I could maybe I have like the. You can have jokes that work and that do very good, but you've just told them a lot and you kind of got them where they need to be. And so you're more excited about the newer stuff. And so sometimes you can put the newer stuff towards the end because then I want to be excited. So I'm trying to keep myself excited through the whole show. And so I'm making myself like, I'll be like, I'm like, I can't wait to get to this joke. And so then you tell the older ones a little more excited because I'm just excited to get to this new one. And so you're just trying to build yourself because it, it can be very easy to get, sometimes you can get into like an autopilot. You can be out of the joke. I can be on stage and you, I mean, it's just, you, it's not like you have complete control over it. Your brain just is like, what are you going to do tonight? Or I mean, you're sad. I mean, I've thought up there like, it's you know, you'll be up there telling these jokes and you're like, it's stupid that these people are even listening to this. <laughs> this these are, this is ridiculous. Because you've said it a thousand times. Because you've said it a thousand times. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't, you know, what's going on? I've had like, if the laughs are not as big as I think they should be in my head, and I'm like, well, maybe this just this next special just won't be as good. Not everybody has good specials. Every special, like I mean, it's very weird, bad thoughts. That's happening while you're talking. While you're talking, and That's so insane. then I'll catch myself being like, you're not, you're you're on another world, and you need to get back to what you're doing right now, and then I'll make myself, then get back into the story I'm telling. And then like really start picturing, like really remember the story and then picture it and start like saying it as if I'm there again. And it's just to make myself get back to, you know, so then you're actually back to like doing the show. And you don't, I mean, you don't have, you just don't have control over it because you don't know where your brain, I mean, it's like anybody that talks, they can, their mind can wander. So your mind's going to wander. You're just on stage in front of 2000 people. And so <laughs> it's just a little bit different. So then you just make yourself like get back. And sometimes it's good for your mind to wander. Cause it's like, you could be in a joke and it wanders and then you maybe get a new little thing out of the joke. Cause you're always kind of trying to find a little extra stuff, like a little extra angle to do a joke. And maybe the joke gets a little longer and you come up with something and you're like, oh, you get off stage and you're like, oh, I have this, I did this thing and that was funny. And then you want to add that into it. I'll admit while you were telling that story, I was thinking about my experience of doing podcasts, Yeah, which is, it's exhausting. And because you're listening with your face and your eyes and your ears, but you're also like thinking about what you're going to ask or say next. And I'll admit a lot of times you can maybe tell I'll, you'll stop talking and I'll open my mouth and I have no idea what I'm about to say. And I, that's kind of like the unedited version of the podcast that I think, I don't know if you're, if you if you're driving your car and you're not interested in this podcast, maybe you don't like it, but that's something that I've felt has been, uh, just very conversational about it. Yeah. But, uh, and even as I'm saying it, I'm feeling self-conscious about revealing that. That these, well, it's good. I mean, you never know. You, you need to let stuff go where it's going to go and you don't want it to anything to be boring and, uh, you know, I mean, I've done interviews with uh, a lot of times it could be like radio and stuff. And you can tell when they're not into it. And then, you know, I mean, I've done stuff where guys have just started a podcast. And That's I remember, hard. Like, yeah. I and mean, it's like you feel like you're caring that you're like, I feel like I'm doing more work than you guys. You're like, why don't you just your leave? show? <laughs> like, I'll just host the. Hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're uh, it's brutal. Uh, That's hard. But they're yeah. You, you, you know, staying conversational is. That was a thing I learned from Burr, uh, was about being conversational. Him and uh, another, Patrice O'Neill, who passed away, like, who died like a few years ago. But Patrice was the most conversational comedian I've ever seen. Where even as a comic, you were like, God, I don't know if these are. Is he making this stuff up right now? We can usually tell. Oh, because it's it just feels so authentic. It just felt so just in the moment. Because he was so good. At, he would talk to the audience, and he was so good at talking to the audience. And then making uh, like a joke or something that he had into what that guy's experience was. And so that, that combination of both of those things was very hard to tell if like which part has he said before, which part has he not said before. Right. And it was very neat. But, you know, it was talking about like even writing jokes out word for word. Like Seinfeld is someone that like, I don't think I write comedy like the Seinfeld writes. Like Seinfeld writes word for word, so he it can borderline be, I think, somewhat a script. Wow. And 
and mine has never been like that. I I I know like where I want to get to in each joke, so I'll know like, you know, the ice. You know, well, I don't know. It's like, uh, you just I just know the parts I'm trying to hit. And for me, I need to know how I'm going to start the joke, and I need to know how I'm going to get out of it. And if I don't know how to get out of it, that's when I have trouble because I don't know <laughs> where it's going to go or on stage. Like, whoa. Yeah. And so you'll just be like, if I don't know how to, if I don't know how to get out of a joke, I'm not going to deliver the joke with confidence. Yeah. And because I'm just too like, you know, in your head, you're just searching. And if it, if it doesn't come, then you're just kind of like got a bell on the joke completely. And, uh, you know, and that usually can get a laugh because you can be like, oh, I don't know where this joke is going. And that, that will do enough. But I don't want to rely on that. That's like a trick. Yeah. So I don't want to rely on like that. But, you know, sometimes it happens and you get stuck. Uh, and you, so for me, I, I need to know. But if I don't write it out word for word, it helps it stay more conversational. Yeah. And then that's when your act, once you can get your act, you're trying to get it as close to be, being like whatever makes you funny off stage, And uh, you're trying to make your act be that. So you want, you know, you want the audience to be like, you remind me of like my buddy that's very funny. Or like you're like, you know, or I always say like even because I'll have a lot of couples come to the show and I either want like, I would say I want them to laugh at me or with me. So they're either they laugh because it's happened to them or they laugh because they can see it happening to me or whatever. <laughs> and so you want, you know, when you have couples come, it's like I'm either your husband or my wife is your wife or whatever it is. And, you know, it's making it relatable is what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite parts of seeing the show, and it's been a while since I've seen uh, live comedy, was one of my favorite parts was these sort of moments where you just seemed like you were totally yourself. And it was almost like, you, you do this thing where you kind of half say a word, you yeah. know what I'm talking about? And then yeah. you kind of just drop it or go to a new word or, and we all know what you're talking about, but it's almost like this, like, is it self-effacing? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm self-deprecating a lot. I make fun of myself a lot. And then I, yeah, like sometimes, you know, yeah, you, you, you can even stop the word. Cause you're like, I do know they know. And then you just kind of get out of it. And sometimes it's maybe it's because it's like that's as big as that joke's going to get. That's the biggest laugh it's going to get. So I just need to get out of this joke. Like, <laughs> I don't need to really wrap it up. And like, you know, if I wrap it up too much, it can be too performing. It can be too if I don't wrap it up and, you know, if I kind of keep it loose, it's more just like we're hanging out. Yeah. And it's just being funny. Uh, so you end up just doing, you know, it's all about rhythm. It's uh, rhythm is a big thing. Like I'll choose words because of the rhythm. Yes. I say real good a lot. Like, and uh, I'm like, this went real good. And it's like, I like the rhythm of real good. Real good is like, so when I'm doing this, whatever the sentence I'm doing, real good just flow makes it flow better than being more precise. And then, so sometimes you can add words. Sometimes you got to take words out. Uh, but you're just trying to like, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, just it can be a song when you tell a story can be like uh, it can be kind of a song that you're just kind of going through it and that's when some people like I close for this for this tour now I I mean I got a new hour but then I close with old jokes because I think people want to hear some of these old jokes and I've learned which old jokes they want to hear sometimes that I they think they want to hear an old joke but I'm like you don't because like <laughs> jokes are all about surprise like that's yeah. the, that's why comedians are so protective of their material because it's like it's about the surprise the surprise is what's the the entire joke and so some stuff is not like you got to keep it uh some stuff is like they that's where i think they think they want to hear this joke and you're like you don't because you know where everything's going to be but then some stuff is like you just enjoy hearing that story again and like there's a bunch i always try to have a bunch of little laughs in a joke i always try to say i never try to get too far away from a laugh because the farther you get away the bigger the laugh has to be right so i never want to put that much pressure on a laugh so i just always try to have a bunch of little laughs always going with it and then hopefully the biggest one is at the end it's so funny that you say that about the um the old jokes because um you know i tried to not do too much research before the show mm -hmm. on Friday. Um, and it was great because I heard someone in the audience yell, coffee with cream. And I was like, what are they talking about? This yeah. is going to be good. And then you closed with it and it was hilarious. And I thought to myself at the time, I was like, why would you want to hear a joke you've already heard? And I realized that it's not because it's a joke. A, a joke is 
kind of, I think, more of like a one-liner or yeah. like, you know, what's brown and sticky? A stick. Yeah. That's very predictable. But it's it's because it's, you're not telling a joke. You're telling a story that's very funny. Yeah. And I remembered back to, I before I got into Bill Burr's pod, I was first introduced to the helicopter story, yeah. which I'm sure you know. Yeah. Um, it's uh, If you're listening and you haven't heard it, go on YouTube and just type in Bill Burr helicopter. We're going to plug Nate's shit. Don't worry. You're going to... It's gonna all get... Bill Burr. <laughs> we want Bill Burr. Bill Burr's got a new special out. <laughs> Might as well say it's a great special. Paper Tiger. Nate really loves it. Um, but, you know, like my experience with that was this strange thing that it was just human habit that I listened to it and I thought it was hilarious. Someone showed it to me. And then I wanted to watch it with other people. And... Before the show, before before the podcast, you came over today. I played everyone uh, the the uh, the milk. Yeah. What's the name of that joke? Ice coffee with milk. No, no, but oh, ice coffee with cream. Just no, no. It was just the milk. It, they, oh, milk with ice in it. Milk with ice. They didn't play the coffee with cream. I think it was yeah. today's show or tonight's show. Yeah. But anyway, that goes back to one of my favorite parts of the show on Friday was um, in the beginning. You talked about how there's a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. But then you said, you know, because I got this show. And then you said, but the pressure is actually on you because if you brought your friends, yeah. your credibility is going to be pretty damaged if I'm not funny. Yeah. And that just, I was bursting because that's like a very relatable thing when you go out on the limb to suggest a joke or a comedian or a friend or a song or whatever it is. We're so bombarded. But anyway, I just really was thinking about that idea of how hearing a really well-told story that's funny is incredibly pleasurable and i didn't really even realize that and it is fun to, when you you get to show new people i mean look at all the memes uh, the funny videos <laughs> that you try to be like have you seen this one and you want to see because you want to see someone else laugh at it because mm -hmm. everybody love you do you get enjoyment i've seen people have enjoyment and so it is a big part of that and so they want to like and that's why sometimes i even do it i mean you don't it's not like you want to go I need to build a new act. So it's, you, I don't want to be doing these jokes for the rest of my life. Like uh, you want to be having these new jokes that can become those jokes. But, but don't you, sorry to interrupt, but don't, don't you think that <laughs> you did joke about doing coffee with cream for the rest of your life or something, yeah. right? But like, don't you think that at some point it's just like, it's such a good story and you do it so well that don't you think you just, it's just like you just slip into it and you're like, this yeah. is it like like do you, do you think that on your deathbed you will have one joke do you think and it, and it might not be that one but do you think that it will be unequivocal that you will have one that was just like there was nothing i didn't do anything there was, than uh yeah i mean I, I think you i mean you hope that there's more and you hope that <laughs> the the i think you want people to people have different jokes that they like right and uh so i mean you can definitely tell which one is the one that they get the most and it's that one is the one Really? right now and like yeah it's i mean so for but that there reason, is other ones i mean there my special is like you know i have people i have a joke where we're talking about a golfing and i have my shirt off and an old man uh goes olivia and he, he thinks i'm i have no shirt on <laughs> and he thinks i'm he's, he thinks i'm his wife his elderly wife uh and so i get yelled olivia a lot and uh they're, you know, so you have different ones that they would, I think you want, you know, I look at it as like Seinfeld. Like when you talk about Seinfeld, like we talk about what shows. Marble Rye. Marble Rye, like, you know, uh, the the sea was angry that day, my friends. <laughs> like when he tells that big, uh, you know, there's, there's there ends up being, there there is like, there's one, the contest is like one, and then like all these things. But then you're like, oh yeah, there's a bunch actually that you kind of end up, and everybody kind of has like, the same the same one so you hope it ends up being like that but yeah I'm, i you know you don't want to be just a one hit person but yeah i'm not that is the biggest joke i'm i love telling it the uh, i wouldn't tell it if if i felt like the audience wasn't laughing as right. as if they but when they laugh you they're laughing as if they first heard it yeah and i know that they've all heard it and so as long as I still get feel that enjoyment from them, then I will always tell that joke. But then if you start feeling where people are like, all right, we've, you know, we've, we've heard it enough <laughs> and you hopefully have some new ones that you can switch to. I'm just remembering that. I, I don't know if you know, but John O'Hurley was, uh, was on the podcast. Uh, Mr. Oh, Peterman. Yeah. Oh yes. It was profound. Yeah. I wasn't ready for the level of depth that he was prepared to go. Yeah. I mean, he's on, you know, he's, I just watched one with him the other day. Uh, buying Kramer's stories yeah. like when it's and it's so funny 
it's so funny that he's just buying. <laughs> he's like the very pants that I was going to return. Uh, it's just such a funny episode. He was, yeah, I, I, uh, he was at the Jason Day golf thing. I didn't get to meet him, but uh, I would have loved to. But he's, uh, he's very, he's, he's in the golf business. Yeah. Oh yeah. Golfino is his uh, clothing brand. Oh really? Yeah. I didn't uh, know it's that. his wife's. I'm going to mix something up. It's on the pod. It's all, yeah. all the all the info's there. Yeah. Archived. Okay. So, uh, Tennessee. Mm. How do you? That's where you're from, right? That's where I'm from. How do you we describe? We live there now. It's a completely different. Uh, I'm from Nashville. It's completely different than it was growing up. I mean, it's a city that's changed so much. I love it very much. Uh, I mean, I, I go to so many other cities, and I even think about like when you live in other cities, and I just don't. Like now that we're back, I was gone for 13 years, and then now that we're living back there, it's uh, it's you know I just I always think I was like every city I go to, I'm like could I be living here? And you just think about you know the normalcies that you know in every city. Like when you drive down the interstate, you know like I've been driving down this interstate for 30 years, and uh, I love like just being. I always loved going home to Nashville. I love I know where everything's at, and and now Nashville is this cool town that everybody wants to move to and and so many people are i mean no one's from there anymore and uh i'm from i'm the only one that's from there like in our neighborhood all my neighbors are from somewhere else and so it's so great and it's just such a cool town and it's cool to see it become as cool as i know it to be i need to get back there I've, i think i was there 15 years ago and i kind of have my life is like divided in half by pre-golf and now golf so when i was in nashville i didn't play golf and i've heard there's incredible golf there yeah yeah the vanderbilt legends is where i play and it's where vanderbilt's golf teams their home course oh cool and then, but they have a the golf club of tennessee is a, a really big one out there that's like where snedeker practices and uh and then they have the honors course i think that's a little bit farther out maybe near chattanooga and that's like a top 100 course and yeah, they have like uh, amazing courses. Hermitage Golf Course is a public course. I I, I worked there when I was fifteen. Really? I carried the uh, scorecard for. The, they used to have an LPGA event, Sarah Lee Classic. Walked on a, a woman's line, her putting line. Oh no! I didn't. I was like, you know, fourteen. I was just like carrying my <laughs> dumb sign, and they're like, ah. and I was like, I don't. Like, uh, <laughs> And then just walk right through it. But it was, uh, yeah, they got a good, uh, they got a good little golf. You can golf almost all year round there. Yeah. You get some parts where you can't, but it's, yeah, it's good. When did you begin playing golf? Oh, uh, when I was a kid, I played. And then, uh, you know, never anything too crazy. Just played it, but like, it's not like I was like thinking about it all the time or something. My brother actually, my, they gave, my, my parents had my brother give lessons. My brother could have been, I think he would have been really good. I mean, he never did it or anything, but he just had a very natural swing. And That's it, Brian? Could, no, my brother. What's your brother's name? Derek. Derek. And uh, so he, uh, I think he could have played. I mean, I always still tell him now, like, if he'd go give lessons, I think he would be, he could just hit it. Just a very, very good swing. But uh, we played, you know, I played growing up. My dad played, and uh, we, I loved it, and then, I got I got really I worked at a golf course and uh, it was a very fun job and I I got into it when I was starting to do comedy I started playing a little bit some in New York it was a little bit harder and then when we lived out here for a couple of years we I was starting to, that's when I started playing it was seven years ago I started playing where you may try to play once a week and then when I moved back to Nashville five years ago was, I became a member somewhere in Old Hickory Country Club. And uh, which is a great look. That's the town I grew up in. And so and then I started playing like I would just when I was on the road, like I mean, because I, I go on the road and I would go out like Thursday to Sundays. So I, I could go always play like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I started getting like really into it and like just like I love it. Like I love golf because it's, you know, I think as a comedian, and I'm sure it's everybody's brain goes crazy but like your brain is just d never stops right and it's it can be so exhausting and you just have all these thoughts and it, it just doesn't go away so i know like i can't even if I watch a movie there's nothing i can do that like can shift my brain from stopping working except golf 
because it's how much focus has to go into golf. So like when I when you're at, it's the only time that I feel like I'm not thinking about comedy or your career or whatever you're trying to do and you just like you just you just go out there you almost forget you can have a phone you forget everything because you're just thinking about as you're playing just the the course and the and then trying to and then when you're working to try to get better i mean it's just how much work goes into that is uh unreal you know uh, do you like hit the range are you like a yeah, I mean, I can go there. I can go to range for three, four hours. Like, I mean, I can, you know, I like to play more than like the range, but like, I'll I'll go and just try to, just you know, it's like it's like you know, in comedy or anything you do. If you want to get good, you have to uh, just keep doing it and just go hit and just you know, just all day long, just work on stuff and. It's it's just you know you just end up you got all those balls laying there and you just knock one over and hit it and keep doing it and it's just you know I mean I, I love it I love watching the ball flight I love you know learning how to do stuff I love watching golf I love you know I always loved watching golf I mean I'm a huge sports fan but golf is so interesting because it's like I love how long it is I love you know when Rory I mean is the bad when Rory fell part of the Masters that time but it's like you're watching like he's a kid and you're watching someone like kind of lose everything and he's by himself. And I think we relate to it as comics cause you're up there by yourself. And as a golfer, you're out there by yourself and you're just watching this kid, you know, and Spieth had it with the masters and, you know, and you're seeing the victories too, that they get when Spieth did with the British open, when he, you know, he goes and hits that one that goes where they don't know. They're like, it's so far away. And then he's got to like figure out how to get it back. <laughs> with no number no number there yeah there's like you know there's no, no way to figure it out is caddy's got to stand on a hill and be like you got to come this way <laughs> and it's uh it's just like it's the most drama no one knows what's going to happen it's not a movie it's not like there's no script like you don't know what's going to happen until that ball gets hit that's why i even like sports because like you know you have the playoffs like you know in any sport is so fun because you're like i don't know what's going to happen this year in the NBA, we don't know what's going to happen. All these guys have switched teams. And so, like, it's so spread out. And, like, what's going to happen? Who's going to end up winning? And it's just so fun to start a season and then be like, I don't know. It's the only, like, I feel like it's the last thing left, sports that are just that. Like, you know, because with movies, there's spoilers now. People leak stuff. And you can kind of have an idea. And then uh with sports you're just like i don't know i don't know what, what what's going to end up being well and even with films you have this element of what i really always think about is the the true story like if you wouldn't believe it if you were watching the movie you know what yeah. I mean? the, the really bizarre thing is like no that happened to me and you and if and if i wrote that into a screenplay you would be like you would call bullshit yeah 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 and that's uh that's what's remarkable about all of like you know i mean because I, I do i love that stuff i've had that with jokes where people could be like well i don't know if i if they don't believe it i mean that's the thing that i get asked they're like are your jokes true and mine are all true i thought about they're, asking you that but i decided not to oh yeah oh yeah there i'll tell you i mean every <laughs> everyone's true i kind of asked you it yeah. in the end uh everything's true i have a hard time not telling the truth so i mean i the only thing that could be changing like the uh trying to think like the ice coffee with milk that's all true but see the truth uh, is i don't want to know yeah because i don't really care yeah i i like the joke the way it is and i accept it and it's it's obviously not you know um it's not parody and it's not like extreme it, i don't know if it matters it, it doesn't I, I think people want it to be true why they i think they just want to be like they they because your life is funner if it's true <laughs> if you went through these in real life things then they just it helps build uh i had someone ask me like in the meet and greet in san francisco and she's like are those all is that true and i said yes and she's like that makes me happy because it's I, I get it because it's like i've had it where like if something is super embarrassing to someone and they have been through like a like a it's a very funny situation but you're like how you can imagine how brutal it would be to have been in that awkward of a situation and if they're like, oh, yeah, it's true. And then you're like, oh, God, I love it even more. Because it's like you're just it's you know, that person had to go through that. Right. And so then when they're telling it to you, 
there's it's not made up and you're like that's coming from a real place like they felt that <laughs> and like so that makes it more believable and makes you enjoy it because you have felt something similar to that and so i try to keep every everything's true that i've talked about and you know when i take my shirt off and that guy says olivia that guy said olivia like that's you know, it's uh, it's embarrassing that I have a body of an elderly woman, <laughs> but it makes it so much funnier that you do. And it's that you had to go through that and like had to be like, oh, yeah, you know, I even when it happened, I asked the, the valet guy was right there or got our kid that worked it. And I was like, did that guy just call me Olivia? And he was like, yeah, I don't know what his problem. Was. And I just was remember I was like, oh, it's so great. It's so great that he did. Uh, but I think people want stuff to be. They, they just want to, you know, they want it to be true. Because if something's not true and you're making it up, I, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. You can maybe you don't trust them. as You know, it's, it, it really just depends on what your act is. Like, if my act is more authentic, then you want this stuff to be true because that's what you're buying into is the fact that you're this guy that's going through all these things. And I just learned how to tell them in a way that's, a fun way to tell them and maybe I add like sometimes I do with jokes I'll be like can you imagine and then so if right. this joke and then that's this part that's made up is you tell what happened and then you you know I, as a, an old joke that I tell was about the baseball story get inside the park home run off a walk yeah and like that I tell it as from my opinion of what's happening and then I tell it again from everybody else's opinion of what's <laughs> happening and so that the second part is like the part that's made up where you're just imagining what everybody else is thinking. The absurdity of it. The absurdity of it. They're wondering and why you're running around after you got guy, walked. Yeah, <laughs> there's, he's not supposed to be doing it. There's three balls, two strikes. Why is he going? Well, you know, it, it strikes me as two things, right? One is if they're not true, you're lying to the audience very yeah. simply. And that's a real thing nowadays. Yeah. Right? So we're, we're, we're very sensitive to that. And in my career even, right? Like I, I really can't lie right because my only material is my life and on some level if you were lying they would almost make that the reason why it was interesting rather than your level of intelligence to take a true story and make it interesting you want well it's back to the trust thing so if i'm watching you and you're telling me about something i want to believe that like if you promote a product or something if exactly. you're lying then about everything then how do i know that you even care about this yeah. thing that i that i think is cool and speaking so, of which yeah, <laughs> yeah. there uh but like if, if you're telling me the truth on everything and your real experiences with it then i believe it more and i'm like oh all right yeah he likes it and maybe i'll like it like and i think that's what people because now with podcasts and all this stuff, you know, you used to only see commercials on TV, but right. now there's commercials like just regular people are promoting stuff. <laughs> and so then you're, you know, you're just like, does this guy, you know, it's like one thing if Brad Pitt is wearing a watch and you're like, all right, I guess that's a good watch. He's Brad Pitt. <laughs> and then now you're just a dude <laughs> that I'm listening to. Uh, with some of these people you could be listening to, you're like, I, some of these people at home are like, I make more money than the guy I'm listening to. Like, used to go, you know, if you go buy a movie ticket, you're like, it's Brad Pitt. He's a billionaire. Right. And now you're like, I listen to this guy in my car. He's barely <laughs> scraping by. And he's telling me to go wear this, these, whatever. And then you're like, I don't know. You're like, this, this guy, I would never wear that stuff. You know, so you want... The honesty, people want honest, you know, and now we're in a world of nothing's honest and nothing's true and there's angles that everybody's taking. So you want just someone to be real and truthful and I can like, you know, when, and when and if I believe someone, then I can just, whatever their opinion is, I'm like, why well, I, I trust that person. And then if that person comes out that you don't trust and that's, that's why it's just such a huge blow because you're just like, God, dude, I was like, I was in. Yeah. And this is all made up. None of this is even real. Well, yeah. And I mean, you're not, you know, Mitch Hedberg, you don't care. Yeah, that's one-liners. Stephen Wright, yeah. one-liners. So, like, those would fit into that. That's their product. That they're, that's their act Yeah, is is to do these things. So, you're not buying into it or you don't care. I mean, you know, but Burr is very honest and Burr is who right. Burr is. And so, you want 
you know, you're like, well, I'm buying into this person. Yeah. So I want them to be truthful. Well, it goes back to the uh, million little pieces thing. Uh, uh, James Frey, James Fry. Uh, you know, Oprah was like, you remember he like wrote this whole memoir yeah. because essentially you're on stage, you're, you're basically doing a comical autobiography. Yeah. And if you, and if the jokes weren't true, and like I said, this did occur to me cause I was like, are, are these true? Like I, not only while I was sitting in the audience, but even in prep for this, like I was like, I wonder if they're true. And then I was just like, I'm not going to ask because I, it's like your dad is a musician. Yeah. Do but, you really yeah. want to know how he did the joke? How he did the, the tricks? Trick? Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't, uh, but they asked me that if, if he really is and he comes out with me and opens for me. Really? Uh, yeah, just was with me last week. Uh, and so is his name, Brian? So whose name is Brian? Brian Bay. Well, I have an opener. Okay. The guy different that, last name. Different. Yeah. Different. Not related. At not all. related. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We, I saw him in your post and I must have, I, I only read the first five letters yeah. and it was Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think where we even the post would be. <laughs> You said thank you. It was Ohio. It was the Ohio tour where oh, we just yeah. missed each other. Brian Bates Brian was Bates. Uh, open for me there, and and my dad. And so I get asked though, if, is he really a magician? And he was. He he was a he did was a clown. When I was younger. Then he was did magic. Still does magic. Uh, so it's all you know. But they want that to be real. Like if I was like, what if he's not? And then you're like, huh. you know, I don't know. There's just something that gets taken away from it where you're like. Uh, it would have been better if it's real. Yeah. Like just, you know, cause I was like buying into it so much. Well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, uh, sociological shift nowadays, especially with this like one-to-one -one media where it's like, everything is scripted. Everything is retouched. Everything is Photoshopped or edited or it's unreal or, you know, haters going to say it's fake, whatever it is. Like we're just basically all skeptics as yeah. consumers now. And like you go through your feed on whatever platform you're on and you're just like, Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. I don't. W once I see an influencer with one juice ad, I'm out. Yeah. And like, we're just like sh uh, shell shocked. I think you know because the the lies have gotten so subtle. And I think one of the things I think people really like about you is you're just sort of like you walk up and you're like, I can relate to you because the pressure is on me as it's on you. And there's like a relatable authenticity there that I really I just love it because it's you're not. When you're on stage, it doesn't feel like you're trying to get someone else to laugh. It feels like you're just trying to tell them what happened and that you thought it was funny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why stand-up comedy is so good because it's, it's, it's a very, like, it's, I don't know, it's like kind of a older way of thinking. You know, nowadays everything's cut up. Yeah. Like you said, like everything's like these quick clips and stuff. And it's this long thing, this performance that's like this, yeah, you're just telling. And the way you tell it and, like doing an hour that was another thing Seinfeld said where he's like he's like 15 minutes isn't comedy an hour and like it is like when you do a show it's like an hour long show and you're like you're how to tell it is you gotta everything's gotta lead into each other thing and like yeah. that's even so how I remember it all is like I have this chunk lead into this chunk lead into this chunk and then you're really only remembering like five things because you're just those transitions should lead each other into their things but like creating that so it's like comes off very conversational and it's very uh, truthful and honest and it's just, you know, and so people want that to be the, the real thing because now, you know, it is. Everything's like so cut up yeah. that like when you see a video and, you know, it's easy. I mean, it's making a TV show would be like that or making a movie or, you know, where you're like everything's funny because you're like, yeah, we got the best take. And then, but with a live show, it's like, no, it has to be funny right then. Like right. that has to be funny. You don't get to go back and do it again. You, you've you said it, it's out there. And so you, the, the pressure of saying the line, like if I mess up a line, it, that joke's gone. It's like, gone. That gone, that, yeah, it's gone. And so that, I mean, say you mess up a line in a thing that's five minutes long. Ooh. It's gone. Like On stage, on you stage. have to, what do you pull the ripcord? What do you do? How do you Sometimes get? you have to. I mean, I've 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 forgotten stuff. I've Whoa. started a joke and then you just like are like, how does this go? Like, and then you you just have to. You're just like, I don't know. I don't know how this goes. I don't know why it would be funny. And you just have to bell on the whole thing. Can and you address you, it? You can't address it. I I would address it being the very honest <laughs> approach is you just address it and you get a laugh off that. But then you're thinking like. That was five minutes that I was planning on. That was going to take away. I got to do an hour. And now 
I don't know. Now you're like, what am I going to do? And if it's towards the end, like, oh, yeah, you know, those. where like you're like, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, like, it's, it's, you've messed it up. You've messed up, you know. That's why there's so much practice into it. Like, that's right. why there's so much into it. So when you don't, so when you're under a situation where you can't mess up, uh, you know, if you're taping a special or, or really a Tonight Show more than a special because you do two shows. But tonight's show, like where it's like, yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's got to be happening and it's got to be done correct, you know. That's scary. Yeah. Is that scary? Uh, you get nervous. I mean, I've done a bunch of them now. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's definitely. You've been on uh, a bunch. What have you been on? You've yeah. been Conan. Conan, uh, Tonight Leno. Show. Yeah. Yeah, with all of Fallon. Conan or Fallon. Fallon. Is my two. Uh, and Fallon's been, the, you know, I've done 10 of those or something. He plays golf, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You mm-hmm. ever play with him? I've never. No. You got to yeah. get him out there. I know. I don't know how much he gets to play. Right. Uh, or what's the priority level of what, you know, he's pretty, he's pretty busy. Uh, I've told him I want to play, but. You said something earlier that's interesting. First of all, your description of golf was fascinating to me. I've never heard anything like that. The idea of the individual. I mean, I've, I've thought about it, but, but as a relation to a man on stage alone or a woman or yeah. person on stage alone, that was fascinating to, to see from the, my perspective, from the audience. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about how you said that, uh, you know, in golf is one of the rare times where you can get away from your job. Yeah. And when you were talking about your job, I was actually being reminded of golf, the, the level of incredible mental kind of um, attention that golf demands. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting that the only thing that can kind of pull you away from a job that says mentally present moment demanding is golf, which is maybe the only other thing that I can think of that's that demanding. Um, I'm just curious to know, like, is there is there a technique behind that? You know, we I've done a lot of research on meditation and golf, and Jason Day, obviously, who you uh, you played Mirfield with last week, mm-hmm. which I can't wait to talk so to you more about that. Yeah. yeah, you know, he he's big into meditation, and yeah. has that ever come up for you in in golf or being on stage? I've never met. I know people. Uh, I know people talk about meditation. I've never done meditation. I, it's uh, I don't know. I'm like uh, it's like therapy to like like it's like uh, I know it's good. It's a very uh, you know it's a good problem to have. <laughs> I feel like if you, if you have if you have the time to meditate, I I think I tend to think like I always remind myself that like people have real lives and jobs like (laughs) their lives are so busy and they're like you know like if you told some guy that's like a construction worker but you meditate he'd be like what are you out of your mind like he doesn't have time to meditate like get over yourself and so i can talk myself out of stuff because i'll think that like and uh i mean i have friends that all my friends met like or they go to therapy or something like and it's just like you you know, the idea that you like, you get to go talk to someone about your problems. Like, A, you have to be doing so good in life <laughs> to be like, you can go like, you're like, the fact that you can go pay someone to be like, can you hear me complain about how my life is great? Uh, or I can complain about my parents. But on some level, you must also see the other side of it. I don't, I, I mean, I com- get it. I, no, no, I know. I'm just, I'm, I don't care. Right. Like, uh. I have my buddy, uh, I walked in on him meditating in my house. <laughs> you walked in on he's him. In my, he's in the, he was staying with me, my friend, very funny comedian, Mike Vecchione. And uh, I said, "Don't please don't do that in my house. No, I'm <laughs> uh, but it was like, just funny to walk in on him. I get like, I, 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 you know, I, I like, uh, I listen to Howard Stern. Howard Stern is TM for like therapy. 20 or 30 yeah. years. And so like I, the idea of that, I think what bothers me is like when people tell people to do it. Right. And you're like, let's not act like, you know, they're, they go, who's the big TM guy, like the, the main. Um, the, uh, it's uh, David Lynch. Yeah. So like, they'll be like, oh, you should go listen to David Lynch. You're like, you know how much it costs to go listen to like him? Yeah. It's not like, so like quit like putting it out to like your fans that are like, go do David Lynch. You're like. Dude, no one can afford to go, like, just go take the time. So that's the, like, I like self-awareness. And, like, so I talk about self-awareness a lot. You always have to be very self-aware. And, like, so that's, like, times where people, I think, are not self-aware, where they're telling people, they're telling their fans that are just, like, trying to get by life and, like, enjoy something. And then they're being told to go 
do something that's going to cost them twenty thousand dollars to go listen to a guy talk about team. Like you like just live in a reality that you understand that maybe people can't get to go do these things. I do think when you're operating on a high level of like a Jason Day or Howard Stern, I, I do get the idea of therapy because you your problems you still have problems. Your problems are just much higher, and you really can't complain to anybody. I'm a big component of telling people to complain. I think you should complain. I think you should complain to friends. I think you should have a group that you complain with. I don't think it, it doesn't need to be a big group. You don't want to be a complainer, but you do need to complain to like a small group because you do need to, because stuff is frustrating. Whatever job you have, you could be like, why is that guy getting a promotion? And I'm not. Mm. And you need to get that off your chest. So I do, I'm not against like uh, complaining and like, and then I think if you get to the level of like, a Howard Stern, even like Jason Day, that you get this high, like who are you going to complain to? Like right. Jason Day can't, Go complain to a guy that's trying to barely get on the PGA Tour and be like, dude, it's just so frustrating, these guys. You know, because yeah. that person's like, why would you're lucky to be where you're at. Yeah. And then you're like, well, you can't. So your level of who you complain to has to be at the level of success that you're at. Right. For that person to listen to Peers. You. Yeah, it has to be peers. And your peers are always going to. Someone asked me about, like, having mentors. And I always think your mentors change, and they should change. Because your mentors should be they're always going to be at different levels. When right. I first started, I remember a guy running around doing two open mic sets in one night. He did. And I was like, this is crazy. This dude's doing two shows in one night, open mic. But then you pass, then you kind of get past where that guy's at. So then your new mentor has to be a little bit above you. And then your next mentor has got to be above that. So you're, you're never going to have, you shouldn't have one mentor. Okay. You should, your mentor should always be moving up because you should be moving up. If you have one mentor, like, you know, unless it's Seinfeld, like, you know what I mean? Like, who's it? Who's my, you know, it's got to always kind of be going up and like, who are you going to talk to? I like that idea. Yeah. But meditation's good. Go meditate. I don't know. <laughs> I've never done I think it feels, I think I would, uh, I would think it's too stupid. Like, I'm kind of more interested in the idea of the complaining thing. I think that's actually really smart and interesting because I haven't even clocked it. But I do know that when I meet or have the rare, you know, I don't get to spend a lot of time with colleagues that are, you know, like you said, Rick Shields is a good yeah. example. Like, you know, we, we don't all live in L.A. and, you know, um, making golf videos is a niche within a niche. Um, making YouTube videos is one thing. But someone else who makes golf videos, like I really value my time with other content creators within golf because there's so much shared experience and and. On some level, yeah, it's the only person that I can actually complain to who's going to relate. Yeah, and they got to be at the level that you're at. Yeah, because it's if it's someone you know, and you need to have that because you got to blow off that. You can't let stuff like just build up. And I'm sure this is what meditation therapy is all about. <laughs> we but can leave that behind. But it's like, uh, but it's like you can't let stuff build up. Yeah, and because then you get resentful and you get bitter, and that's nothing's good about that at all, and like that, and people won't be want to be around you if you're like that. So you just you have to like have the people where, you know, for your world, if you could be like, oh, I don't know, why is, how this guy's got a bunch of you know, this people are talking about this guy, this guy's a phony, he's not whatever <laughs> it is, and you just need to get it off your chest, and yeah. you need someone else to be like that guy is a phony, you're like right, right, and then you just have to have that complaint. Whether it's whatever, and it's any field that you're in, you have to be able to like, just like vent and have someone that's like, uh, that is like, no, I know, man, it's stupid, it's ridiculous, and then you can be like, all right, and then you can calm down, and then you're you can go back to doing what you got to do, but you have to. I always say that with comedy, you have to. I always said you need to have a guy right above you and a guy right below you, because you need to be listening to what he's saying, but you need to be saying it again to someone below you. So you're at least saying it again. So then you're reminding yourself what you need to go do. And then that you always just keep someone right above you and right below you. Like you can't go too high. Like you can't go, you know, like as I've been saying Seinfeld the whole time, but like I couldn't go when I'm starting open mics, I can't go ask Seinfeld what an open mic is like. He hasn't done one in 30 years. <laughs> So it's stupid to go to him and like, he's not going to help me. Right. I need to talk to someone that's like, oh yeah, I just got out of open mics two months ago. Right. And that guy will give me way more advice than Seinfeld could give me. Cause I couldn't even handle the information Seinfeld would be giving me because his problems are much bigger problems or like he's going through different things. And then as your career rises, 
then you can get closer to then you can ask Seinfeld something and then he could give you some actual advice that fits the life that you're in right now. So what would you ask Seinfeld? If I, you know, it'd be, it'd have to be something, you know, it's like creating a show, like how much is he, it was in the writing. Like, I'd want to know, like, how much was he in the writing room when he created his show? And like, how much did he, involvement, like, did he have, how much trust did he have with other writers? How, it's hard for comedians to have trust with the writers because sure. we know what's funny. And so it's hard to like, let that go and like, be like, well, this person's also a comedy writer. They don't do stand up, but they write comedy. And so how do you trust that? And how do you, you know, how do you learn to, you know, like deal with that? How do you learn to balance like performing stand up if you were trying to create a show and have that balance of both of those things? And uh, so it, it would be more, it would be stuff like that. And like on the road and like, what do you do on the road? And like now when you go out and like, you know, cause now you have people coming to see you and that's a new thing that I've never had. Like, I was always doing clubs where no one knew who I was. And now all these people know who I am. And so like when you perform for them, that's, it's kind of a different experience and uh, a different relationship you have with this audience that knows who you are. And so it'd be more questions along those lines now. But if I would have asked that five years ago, it's like, I don't, you know, even if he tells me, it's like, mm. I'm not dealing with that problem. <laughs> so like, you know, it, it would have been fun to know, but I just wouldn't take the information in as much as I would take it in now. Right. So it would have been like, I'm wasting that guy's time when, you yeah. know, so. Uh, um, describe your, uh, describe your golf game. It's, uh, it's getting better and it's, uh, I'm learning, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I play like, I mean, I play so much. And uh, I play more where it's like I can't even I play bad, but someone's like, well, I don't get to play as much. And I'm like, I play so much. Like, <laughs> there's, there's, no there's no excuse. <laughs> and it's funny how, like, it just you can have every day where stuff clicks and you can uh, you're just like, oh, this is working. Like, you're like, oh, that's what it is. Like, that's what it, you know, it's like, I don't know, the swing is keeping your arms out of the swing as much and not really trying to like, I don't know. It's like a, you can over, you can overthink golf just as much as you can underthink it. And like, uh, so I would say it's like, I'm trying to be s smoother and, you know, trying to get better and trying to, I want to go, uh, enjoy a golf course. I think it's very easy to go out there and you could be playing Mirfield you could play Pebble beach and you could not enjoy it because you're, too into your game or your swing it's very easy to just think about you problems on a golf course and every shot's terrible and I want to go like really enjoy the design of a golf course and it's trying to I would always try to get good enough to like people always say like it's putting and chipping or putting you know and I was like trying to get good enough to be well putting becomes the problem because before it's like it's like, well, you got to get putting. You're like, well, if I'm putting for a six, it doesn't matter. Putting's not the problem. Like, it's taken me seven strokes to get to the green. So let's putting. We'll worry about that. But there's other. You're almost just trying to get to where the problem becomes one thing, where it's like chipping, and then, and it is to like you know where the ball's essentially going to roughly be going, and uh, just to enjoy the game more. I mean, I'm trying to like really appreciate a course more than I ever have. I just played Olympic Club in san francisco yesterday and uh so it's like and the guys i played with uh these are the guys i've become friends with and they are very nice and one of one of, one of the guys is very good he's like a one handicap so it's uh i was like to talk to him just about like what he likes about a course and you know just to be like what's you know i don't know what do you appreciate of a course and like learning to really enjoy because these are designs it's an artistic thing that when these guys make these courses and trying to just learn to appreciate that more. So when you're out there playing, you're like, you know, you're not worried about your game and you shoot what you shoot. You know, something that you say, I remember you say, you, do you not keep score right or you, not as much? Or, I don't uh, make that the forefront of my experience. Yeah. But, I, but if I play well, I definitely keep score and I tell everybody. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things people, you see posted like, like we show, like it's a meme. Golf memes are, I love them. They're great. 
because they're it's just such a specific funny thing <laughs> but it shows like the guy like after you birdie the first time you're like i'm gonna just work on a few things and it shows like a long ball hitter <laughs> and then you're just like oh you know out there Are you, uh but i i think i heard you say that like not keeping score just so you can like enjoy it and i've tried to like do i mean I, I've, I've not done it but i think about it and where i want to and i want to get good enough to where like i could be like yeah i don't really keep a score you know, like when I played with Jason Day, like he doesn't have a scorecard. He doesn't need a scorecard. Well, he's I mean, either going to be too low. Yes. Well, but when you're if you shoot high, then it's you know that's where it's going to be bad. Like this year, like I'm right now, like I'm a five point nine. That's good. And like it's great. And I but the goal this year was to get into the fives, and I want to be in the thick of the fives. I don't want to be just barely hanging on a five where you're like I'm not really a five, but <laughs> yeah. like. I always wanted – and last You're closer to a six. Uh, yes. Oh, I'm way closer <laughs> to a six. And then – but I remember wanting to be a single-digit handicap. Like, I uh, – you know, I was like a 12, and I was like, I just want to be single-digit. I want to be able to say I'm single-digit. And then the person's like, yes, he's a single-digit. <laughs> and Confirmed. Confirmed. Like, they can tell, uh, like, you're, you are the legit thing that you are. Yeah. And so I've been asking guys about going, like – like, they were saying, like, six to four – and then, like, once, you know, Jason was even saying, once you get to four, you're, uh, you get to, like, you're, you, you're, like, right now I'm, like, pretty good at, yeah, I'm fine at everything. Like, I, everything's, like, fine. And, like, I'm not, there's not anything too crazy that's going to happen. You're going to double bogey stuff still, but you're not, it's not as bad. But, you know, you're just shooting the 80s. I'll break eight. In my home course, I can shoot in the 70s. Uh, but when you play new courses, it's going to be a little bit different and yeah, you're going to like, see what happens. <laughs> and then, uh, so it's like learning to get, they were saying like when you get to four and below, it's like, that's when it gets real hard. Like, and that's when you, it, it becomes a much slower jump right. to like get down. And that's when you're having to, cause you're having to shoot in the seventies every time right. at that point. Jason was, uh, he kept his handicap when he was number one. No Is way. That, yeah. Cause I always ask these guys if they keep their handicaps cause the pros don't. And, uh, you know what he was when he was number one? Number one in the world. What number was his one in the world. Well, his scoring average must have been 69 and a half. Mm -hmm. So, handicap might have been plus five? 8.1 plus 8.1. What? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope what? he doesn't care that I'm telling everybody. Jason <laughs> that, Day. Fine. Jason Day, 8.1. Standing on the first tee, shooting nine. Yeah. His first ball is a nine. Nine. Wow. It's crazy. Plus eight. He is a tweaker. Yeah. <laughs> it's so like and i love seeing that to be that good like i love greatness that the things like so i love like just you know i think it's fun i think it's fun to have like, watching whether it's jason or tiger or we all these guys and or even you know lebron or like i love watching where you're watching something where it's like a great it's like a once in a lifetime thing right and i love like when he was number one in the world it's like he was the, like there was there's this is it's not an opinion, it's not a debate. It's like there's stats. Yeah. He's the greatest golfer on earth of people golfing, and that's just what it is. Yeah. Like and so it's like you know I don't know very neat. And as far as we know, there's no golf outside of planet Earth. So he's the as, best golfer the in the best universe. In the universe, yeah. They should actually rename it. Yes, in the universe, yeah. But maybe there are you know. It's possible. Maybe golf's a huge, huge game. You know. You, uh, you um, gamble when you golf, or? I mean, I have a friend that I play with. We play with regular, and he's he's good. And me and him, uh, I've got a good game gambling, where uh, we play stroke, and we play where if you, for us like we you have to break eighty. We're just play stroke play. Oh and wow! Then, uh, that's that's like kind of masochistic. Yeah, I don't know what that word means, but yeah, it, it means like uh, brutal. Oh, why don't you just say brutal? I mean, I could. Well, Brutal's masochistic means that it's brutal, but you enjoy it. Yeah, it's like it's like you're into how painful it is. Oh, okay, this I is think. an easier way to. We get could to Google it. that. I don't know. I would love it if that's not what <laughs> like if the word you don't can, even know what it means. Thomas, Thomas, can you Google masochistic really quick? Just get like get the actual definition here for Nate. Everyone and everyone's Everyone. driving their cars to the law Disclosed. office. To the, the doctors and lawyers are like you fucking idiots. Oh, they're like uh, masochistic. M a s o c h. What does it say? Deriving oh, God. It's sexual. <laughs> Deriving sexual gratification from pain or humiliation. Hmm. 
I mean, that, that is kind of like stroke in play. Your, if you talked in therapy, they'd be like, "Oh, that's interesting. Let's uh, dive into that. Why do you why do you choose that word? That's how they would want to go." And then they would be like, "Oh," and they open another whole thing. Well, see, because I mean, play, stroke play is. I think it's the most terrifying way to play the game because once you get a double, you're basically like packing the clubs. But if they fall apart, which is fun, see, you can watch them. That's masochistic, right? Oh yeah, you're deriving that's pleasure the from your friends. God, like it's I'm that's, I'm I'm all of that word. Uh, uh, Real quick though, does Bergazzi have an origin? I mean, it does, but does it mean it anything? It does. It's very funny, uh, which something that might end up being in my act uh, is we we thought we were Italian. We've said we were Italian. Do jokes about Italian? <laughs> and then I did the twenty three and Me, and I mean, not even a trace of Italian. <laughs> not even. I mean, zero point zero percent Italian. Right. And so it's. Uh, it's it's like Switzerland. It's like we were on the border oh. of like Italy and Switzerland. Swiss so Italian. Like Swiss, yeah, it's like Swiss Italian. But we just have zero traces of uh, <laughs> Italian. And that's all we've ever said. We're like, we're Italian. I, I used to <laughs> do a joke about saying I'm Italian. And then, I mean, so we get that 23 me. like, well, how much Italian am I? And I mean, none. None at all. But saying you're Swiss is like almost, that's like the... That's like one of the worst things you could say because you're not really saying anything. Yeah, you're just like yeah, and that's and that thing that's how we describe ourselves. That's how my comedy is. It's <laughs> very Swiss comedy where it's like it's ah, it's fine, it's fun, you know. Yeah. So okay, so we're talking about gambling. And oh, the, the game playing. that's it. So we play where you have to break eighty. We're trying to make ourselves better, and so we also want to know our score for our handicaps and all this stuff. Sure, so that's sure. why we play that. And then, uh, so if you break eighty, so if you shoot seventy nine. Then the and the other guy shoots an eighty above eighty, then that person wins the money. If we've now changed, if we shoot eighty to eighty three, both of us, then it's a push. Oh, because okay. we play once or twice a week, so we don't want to be just you know. I don't mind gambling, but you're like I can't just be. You lose a thousand dollars a week instead no. of like. Whereas we're not we're not playing for a thousand dollars, but if you play a few times a week, and then uh, if you shoot over eighty three, the, then the, it goes back to lowest score. So then you so that way. We were trying to have check marks to be like, if you're if you're like, all right, if I part the last two holes, I'm gonna shoot an 81 right. or 82. You don't want to be like it's just a push. Now you got to you you can't blow up because if you get above 83, now the money comes back into play. Oh. So you're making yourself. So it's like you're just having like a you know 80 below 80 gets you the money. 81 to 83 we both push because that's where our we're gonna usually end up. And then if you get a black above 83, then it's now the money comes back to play. So then that way when you're, say, you know, because you have the rounds where you're like, I'm not breaking 80 this round. But you can, now you can't blow up because you get above 83, you're back into paying. So my, my question really is, where were you when you came up with this game? He came up with it, my buddy Doug Brown. He's a musician. Uh, and he, uh, he was the one that put it together. He's crazier than I am. It's very I, complicated. It's not as it is, but it's just basically you got to break eighty, right? And then uh, <laughs> eighty-one, eighty-three is nothing, and then you can't go over eighty-three because now money <laughs> comes back in play. If anyone else has played this game, is it? Did he invent it? I think he invented it. It's, I, I get it. I like the idea of uh, desiring to have a lower score overall because yeah. that is ultimately the game of golf. Yeah. Like like a comedy special, it's yeah. Golf is not one hole. It's not fifteen minutes. Yeah, it's the whole day. Yeah, and so you can have those. Yeah, you can. You got to learn to like calm yourself down. Like you can blow up, and then you got to be like, "All right, I got to ease it back in." You realize I can just par from here on. Because you really you have to break eighty. We're I think par seventy two. So yeah, I mean you make seven mistakes, and so you look at those. You know, we I had a whole philosophy one day. I told him I was like, just look at every hole like we're trying to birdie the hole, and then if you made par become bad. Oh. Where instead of bogey being bad, par is bad. And so you're trying to, then you're, you know, and he made fun of me at first because he's like, that's stupid. Of course, everybody's trying to do that. But it's like just the mentality of like golf is like, you realize how much it's the, the, the it's commitment. Right. And that's another thing that I love about it is the commitment of the shot. So you have to like, you can tell when you're starting to try to guide something is when stuff goes wrong. And when you're looser and just trying to be like, I'm going to, if you hit every shot as you're thinking, I'm going to shoot par, I'm going to shoot 140. 
I don't know which one it's going to be, but I'm swinging as if I'm playing for both of those angles instead of trying to be like, well, let me try to just like ease it in. Right. And like, I want to make sure that this is, this has to hit the fairway. And then when you try to guide it is like, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah. Like when you go up, when I see you do your videos, you're talking before you hit. <laughs> yeah. Like you're always like, you know, we can't see the ball on your ace cam. So we just assume it's good. We don't know if you're just like, hey, I'm very honest about the take. reaction though. I think you're very good at golf. So I appreciate you're, that. you're better than, you know, I've had to like figure out where I want to feel. You're pretty good though. I'm only and at 4.7. I thought you were better, you know, because now you're doing all this. So your game's suffering. Well, when we play today, um, well, first of all, let's talk about where we're going to play. Um, I was thinking it's kind of getting late. It's four mm -hmm. o'clock. Sun's going to set in two and a half hours. It's probably not the most special round. I reached out to a few places. It's tough because it's a Monday. Um, have you ever heard of or played the Los Feliz Par 3? Uh, I don't think I have. It's where they shot swingers. Oh, yeah. And I think that could be fun. Yeah. It's, it's off mats, but it's, 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 it's a nine, it's nine holes, right? Nine hole. Confirmed nine yeah. hole. I haven't played it in years. But it's, like, it's just like casual. And it's yeah. got vibes and there's a little cafe and it's kind of an L.A. scene. Yeah. I, I, is that a letdown for you as far no, as no, like, no, no. okay. Because I, I know like you're here, but it, I was actually relieved to hear that you played the Olympic Club. So then I didn't feel like you drag your sticks out here. To no, go play I a played a course. whole, yeah, I did okay. a whole, I went to PXG and did Scottsdale National. Oh, that's right. You played the Battle of the Nine with Bob Parsons. Yes. That's awesome. And that was, uh, the Battle of the Nine's very cool. Yeah, I would love to play they, that. They, uh, that's like, it's, it's like a bigger version of a mini golf. Like, you're like, places should do that. Yeah. And I mean, he's done it. And it's, I mean, he's pretty well. Yeah, it he's helps. doing quite well. Uh, but like it's such a cool idea. Like yeah. it's like the, you know the the ninth hole green is it's as big as this green that we're sitting on That's here. It's crazy. It's nine hundred ninety nine square feet, and That's uh, very small. yeah, very small. And uh, it's just a very cool experience to do that. Like and see it. But I I love like you know it's a part of the game that you should work on and good. Uh, it's a shitty little course. It's a piece. Yeah, of shit. yeah. That's fun. If you're listening to the podcast and you want to see this. Um, we're going to release the video this week, uh, so just check it out on YouTube. You can just probably probably type in Nate. I wonder if you could type in Nate, E-A-L. I wonder if that would bring up the video. It might. It might. I think it would. I think it would. I'm going to go on a whim and just say yes. And if not, you can obviously type in uh, Bergazzi, which Nate, is a yeah. thorough Italian name. It's, it's what we do, man. Big Italian <laughs> big Italian people. Have you gotten a chance to talk with Molinari yet about your heritage? About I, just, I would love to talk to him about it. like just like oh, I get it man. I'm just talking about I get all his problems. So like I get it, dude. I'm Italian. I would if, before I did the 23 me, I'd have made a big deal about it. Right. And then now, it's all my yep. uh, my uh, cousin, second cousin, uh, Ronnie Bargetti. Uh, big. I, I like to always say everybody's name. Just everybody's like, oh okay. Uh, <laughs> but he he won't accept it. We, I told oh. him, I was like, yeah, dude, it's not. And he was like, no, we're Italian. So I like that he's just denying the scientificness. of. That's kind of Italian, actually. It's kind of Italian. <laughs> it's a very Italian thing to do. So maybe we are. Maybe he is. <laughs> it is very funny that he was like, no, that's not true. That thing's stupid. And you're like, okay, all right. <laughs> this is stupid. I love it. Um, all right. So, oh, and last question before we go play golf. We're, we're about winding down here. How many hole-in-ones do you have? So my, mine, I don't count it. Okay, it's, oh, uh, I, I think you should count it before I've even heard the story. Okay, I think then I would have one, and it was a uh, it was just a par three course uh, somewhere in Florida. Uh, playing this was long this is a long time ago. We were there for like kind of a little family trip, and uh, I think it was 122 yards, and it was just a par three course is why I didn't count it, and I hit it and went in the hole, and then what's funny is my cousin that hit after me, and his was on the lip. And so people, and you're in, we were in between all these, like, it was, uh, like, there's, uh, I think it was like condos or hotel property that had a little par three course in the middle of it. And they see his and start going crazy. No one saw it. They didn't see mine. And I'm like, mine's in the hole. They were not <laughs> screaming. So I have that one. And, uh, so, but I, I don't have one on a, a, a full 18. And, uh, so do you count one that's on a par three course? I do, man. Yeah. Because I was thinking about it today, and I was, like, thinking we should go play the Los Feliz Part 3. And I was like, I think I'm going to get a hole-in-one today. This and is like, the ace cam would be every hole. Ace cam's every hole. 
We've done it before. We played uh, Mountain Shadows in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. It's yeah. a nine, 18 hole not par three. Yeah. Which is a little, it's, it's, it's kind of like just a lot of French fries. To be yeah. Honest. There's yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. I never thought of that. You kind of walk off and you're like, I'm still hungry. Yeah. Um, because you want to hit the driver. I, yeah. I, the driver is so scary. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's crazy. I mean, yeah, when you put it, it can get you. That's what my buddy that I play with, his driver gets him in trouble. He can hit it hard and then he can pull it out and then I just wait. I just wait for it. If I'm playing bad, I just sit and wait because I know he's going to swing. He could do three wood and be fine. And he, I wait for him to pull that driver out and then it just, whoosh, <laughs> just takes off and his ball's gone. And then, I mean, now that holds the double. And, me, you and then you're right back in, you know, now the game's back fun. So, yeah, it's uh, – but, yeah, do you count it? Like, that's uh, – I would count it, man. So, if someone asks you, you don't, do you think you have to explain it? I mean, I think, actually, we should, we should post this on Instagram. Yeah. I think right now you should ask if a par three on a, hole in, on, on a par three course counts. Off a mat. Was it off a mat? Uh, that, uh, I don't think so. See, that's even yeah. – if it's not off a mat, I don't know, man. I mean, it's a par three. Yeah. Like, it's not like Jim Nance's backyard with artificial grass. Yeah. It's, I mean, it was 122 yards. It's a pitching yeah. wedge. Yeah. Real grass. That That's, like, I think you could maybe make a case for, like, a pitch and putt, like, mat situation not counting. But the truth is, we're going out today. It's mats. If I get a hole-in-one, I definitely count it. And then I've had two. Had? I've had one. One. And it was, On a real it, course. It was as legit as can be. See, but that's the difference. You're I counting know. that in your head. Right. You're already like, if I, like what if today I go get nine of them, <laughs> and you're still going to be like, well, mine was legit. And I'm like, well, I had nine, dude. Like, you know. I'm only qualifying it because you dequalified yeah, How yours. much? I know, but how good do you feel that yours was legit during a round? Well, see, here's the thing. Did you flush your pitching wedge? Was it where you wanted it to go? I mean, this was so I, – I wasn't playing like I was playing now. Right. So uh, – I don't remember it. I mean, I've already taken it kind of out of my – like, I don't have yeah. the ball. I don't have all these things <laughs> yeah. that, like – and I always – when I get asked, it's a question I don't want to get – like, I get nervous <laughs> answering it. I know I'm going to be explaining it the rest of my life. I'm going to have to just say – I think there's a lot of people that would just say yes and never – and just and, – and be fine with it in their head. Yeah. And I think I – it just You're too doesn't, honest. I'm, yeah, and too honest, and it just doesn't feel like it. You know, and you answered it without even wanting to answer it by going, mine was legit. Well, that see, answered no. it. It's answered right there. You said it. The enjoyment you have <laughs> that we're both talking about our whole one stories and that you get to say yours is legit. You know how good you feel right now? And, like, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I mean, okay. like, maybe. <laughs> like, you know, I'm kind of, like, trying to, like, convince you that mine's okay. I'm trying to convince you that yours is okay. Because you have a real one. So you want... You want to be like, no, man, you're doing great, dude. Like, be happy. You're doing so many people would love to have your thing that you have. I, here's, the, here's the interesting qualifier. I didn't hit a good shot. And it went in. I hit a four yeah. iron. The, the, I'm, I'm at a 200-yard hole, four iron. Can't see the pin. It's on the back left. I skanked a four iron. It hit the front right. I walk up to the green. I look all over planet Earth for it. I'm in the bushes. I'm on the back side of the green. I'm on the front of the green. I'm looking everywhere. Finally, one of the random guys I was playing with who I'd never met said, check the hole. And I was like, don't, don't yeah. tell me to, don't humiliate me like that. <laughs> and I went and checked the hole and I was like, oh my God, it's in the hole. So it's ironic that you, and, and here's a good story. Matt Janella has the same thing. He was shooting. He walked up one day, dropped a ball. He wasn't playing a round of golf. But he hit one shot on a par three and it went in the hole. I don't know, man. Like, I feel like that's a hole in one. I know that a lot of people are going to try to get technical on all of these things. But, like, if you have stood on AT and hit a ball into the hole, that's magical enough. And I feel like we can't get into the, you know. Well, it's like when you see guys try to just hit a bunch of balls and get a hole in one. Like, I've I seen did that. video. Yeah. Did you and I didn't one? do it. Yeah. I hit 1,500 balls. 1,500? On the I, same I hole. This video. I literally no. damaged the green like for long term. How long did that take? Two days. I had I, by the end of it, I was wearing two gloves and no shirt. I mean, <laughs> I was like a mechanic out there. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, when I left, it was 130 yards, and I was hitting like eight iron, seven iron, nine iron pitching wedge. Like I would just go between clubs. Yeah. I had like uh, there was like people helping. We had like a automatic green fixer that like that like it was like a it was like a stomper that would like fix the pitch yeah. marks in one go. And, um, yeah, I mean, by the, I didn't hit a, I didn't even like, I was, so, you know, there's a book on quitting smoking. 
Yeah. And one of the techniques to quit smoking is to smoke like as many cigarettes as possible in a row. Yeah. And then it says, now you feel gross. So just stop. Yeah. And so after I hit 1500 golf shots in two days, I, I literally, I was like, I couldn't even think about golf for like a week, yeah. which was a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And you don't, after the 1500, you're like, I'm good, dude. I'm done. Well, and the truth is like going back to that, like if I had gotten one of those in the hole, would I have counted that as a second hole in one? Yeah. I would say yes. You would say yes because you're just trying it. See, that's. I mean, I didn't do it. You didn't do it. It wasn't easier. Yeah. But you're just trying. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a tournament golfer, so I'm not, I'm not really yeah. ever going to show up anywhere and be like, I'm a 4.7. Today, I'm going to get 90% of my handicap, and I'm looking to like win this. And like, I don't really live my life that way. Like, I don't really ever put pen to paper on a scorecard. I, I know what my score is all the time. Yeah. But like, I think a hole-in-one is just a magical story. And I mean... No matter where it happened, I believe that – I don't know, man. I've, I've been th- I, I agree that's a magical story, and it is. it doesn't matter, but it definitely feels better if it's during a round. <laughs> so, like, that's the that's – the, all, with all that we would say about it, Yeah. even if you made this one, you counted the second hole one out of those 1,500 shots, it's definitely – you are you perked up during the one that's legit. And so, right, like, you can't right. ignore have, that yeah. feeling. Oh, we're going to – I don't even want one today. <laughs> It'd be a nightmare. <laughs> and then you're going to have to say, I've, I've had two. I've had two, and count. then now sit down so I can tell you about them both because I have to, they all come with this story. That's like you think, but think about the guy that uh, hits one in the water and then yeah. plays two balls. Or you know you go out and you're playing two balls? See, but that's still a hole in one, I think. Yeah. It's not a one on the scorecard, but it's from the tee box. It went in the hole. Yeah. I guess. I guess Gang, Golf is such an honest game. So that's the other thing that too. That's but a hole in one does. Should we check the definition of hole in one? I mean, is is hole in one is more of an experience rather than a number? Yeah. Or is it? Is hole in one is does that mean one on the scorecard? The truth is, there's going to be. I mean, one on the scorecard. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're writing a three. Hole in three, which is just yeah. a par. Just a par, and then now you're you're borderline. That's chipping in from a fairway, like right. you know. I've done that. I've chipped in. You know, where that I was hundred and. Eight yards out, that went in for a two. I've had a couple of those. Right. Uh, I chipped in the Olympic Club on the yesterday on that part the 18th, Ooh. and I didn't get out of the sand. <laughs> and it's two sand shots, and the second one went in because I was trying to get. I'm not terrible at the sand. I've gotten a lot better, but I was. You try to get too cute. Yeah. And the flag was close, and I'm trying to like land. Like I'll do all the stuff I don't know how to do, and I'm like, well, I'll probably know how to do. <laughs> like then you, right. and it just goes, and then like comes back in the sand, and then the next one went in, and I poured. Uh, you know, that's one of my favorite uh, golf terms. Is too cute. Try oh. to get too cute with it. You, I, I love it for everything. You get too cute with everything. You try to get too. You do that with with, with my world and stand up. I can have guys that will like we'll do corporate events. And you think like, oh, I'll do this corporate event where you get too cute with it. Like, it's like, oh, what should I do? Like, it's for this company. And like, should I try to do this stuff and like, just go make fun of the company or something? And uh, it's like, don't just do your act. Do the reason they want you there. Right. Don't get because you get too cute with it. And if it doesn't go good, then you're in a hole and then you get nervous and sweaty. And then it can be real bad. And then you got a mess. Then you got a mess on your hands. And it's because you try to be too cute with it and it's like just it's everything in life don't get too cute with anything just do the thing that the thing that they're bringing you in for all right so last question on the podcast first of all if you're listening and you want to hear more of nate all your social handlers are just your name at nate yeah. n-a-t-e b-e-r-g-a-t-z-e b-a-r-g-a-t-z b-a-r bargatze yeah. b-a-r-g-a-t-z-e yeah. and the netflix special is uh chasing uh, what is it the Tennessee Kid. The Tennessee Kid. Yep. And then the previous one was uh, the stand-ups. The season stand-ups. one. That's like shorts. Yeah, it's like it's like a half hour set. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and check him out when he's coming to town. You've got on your website uh, all the shows coming up. You're kind of uh, traveling everywhere these days. Everywhere. Next. Yeah. Coming to your town. Last question. Do you ever catch yourself on stage thinking about golf, unrelated to the joke? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I could, I could, I could see. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's popped in my head. <laughs> like if yeah. you played around that day, and then you're just like, "Oh my god, I think yeah. I thought about a bad shot or a good shot." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could see. Yeah, I think. Uh, I don't think it's crazy. I think I'm sure 
like I can't even really think of the the a thing that would pop in my head. Like I'm very much in the in the in the are trying to keep. I'm always just trying to keep myself in the moment of sometimes on stage. I've worked on that a lot lately. Is just try to be way more in the present. And yeah, like meditation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna start meditating, dude. I make fun of it, and then now it's like <laughs> my whole life's become meditation. Here's the thing, Nate. On some level, do you feel like you have a responsibility to your act to try everything? I do. I yeah. I I do think I want to try. Because you, you know, going to a meditation class, I'm already laughing. There's a class? I'm already laughing, dude. And they're free. With with people? It's a suggested uh, donation, uh, dude. That's disgusting. You can put in whatever so you want. So it's a group of people that are just... I tell you what. Next time you come to LA, I'm going to take you. Oh, my God. I don't even go anymore. I don't I do not do it anymore. Uh, I do meditate on my own, like, sometimes. But it. I would, I'm would. i just already laughing thinking about you going. It would be silence with me going, Eric, I got to get out of here, man. I can't... Yeah. You know, I'd be like, You'd be thinking that the entire time. That's what I'd be meditating about. How much time is left in this? How long do you do it? Uh, I mean, it depends. Like the class itself is usually like thirty minutes of talking, then thirty minutes uh, of meditation. Who are you talking to? Who's talking? A guy's the te- talking. There's a teacher. Oh, and he's just telling you, uh, yeah. like, uh, to calm yourself. It's like down. stand up, but it's just not funny. I mean, actually, sometimes it, it is funny. It, yeah, it could be funny. Uh, I would, yeah, we we'll go meditate. It, I it, would it, go. I would go do it. I need the experience. Yeah, we'll go do it. And we're going. Right, I'll come to Nashville and we'll do it there. Then then it'll be in your hometown. Don't and do it. Don't do yeah. it where I live, man. <laughs> Let's do it somewhere else. Don't like, do that in my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite thing. That is my favorite thing I've ever seen. Is walking and he's <laughs> meditating. I've, I mean, I I think about it often. Just him leaning against my wall with his legs crossed. Mike Vecchione, go look him up. He meditates in Shout other out. people's homes. Are you supposed to give it out? Is this supposed to be a secret? No. No, yeah. no nothing. All right, we're going to go play golf, everybody. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm a big really, fan, man. It's so, been a lot of fun. Yeah. Me too, dude.